Good morning, church, and happy Mother's Day. If you are new and we haven't met you yet, we would love to meet you. Please stop by our Connection Center in the foyer under the Welcome Home sign. We have a gift for you there, and we would also love to answer any questions that you may have. And if everyone could please take a minute to fill out a connection card. You can find the physical cards in the back of the seat in front of you, or they can be filled out electronically by scanning the QR code on the back of the worship guide. Today, May 12th, is the last day to sign up for the Women's Flourish Weekend. Join the women of MCC on Friday, May 17th from 5 to 8.30 p.m. and Saturday, May 18th from 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. as they dive into a three-session series on John 15. The cost is $35, which includes dinner, Friday night, brunch, Saturday morning, snacks and drinks, and a craft for you to take home. To register, you can scan the QR code on the back of your worship guide. If you or your child are graduating this year, please email office at millcreek.org. We would love to recognize you and celebrate you, as well as pray over the graduates on May 26th. We also have a special gift for them as well. Child registration for VBS is finally open. You can scan the QR code on the back of your worship guide or tap the link on the MCC app to register. Once again, we are so glad that you are here this morning, and we hope that you are blessed by the service. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper in darkness tremble?
You may be seated. Today, we celebrate the women who've watched over us, taken care of us, and walked us through life. It's a day to say thank you to every mom. Moms with children running through the house. And moms whose kids are all grown up. Moms who are walking this road all by themselves. And moms who've loved a child in need. Moms who've suffered terrible loss. And moms whose children have become moms themselves. For all the times your love made our lives better, and the moments your lessons made our paths clear. For the way you showed us Jesus by simply being yourself, we say thank you. Whether today is a day of celebration, reflection, or heartache, know that you are loved. Mom, this day is for you. Happy Mother's Day. Morning, church. Morning. Happy Mother's Day. You know, I can't think of any more significant calling from God than that of motherhood. You know, in my own life, the love and prayer investment of my mom, who's now in her heavenly home, is why I even stand here this morning, and I, I honor her. Now, I don't honor her for her perfection or her flawless life. Moms, that, that's not possible. Only God is perfect and flawless. You know, I honor her for her tenacity to always move forward through all the difficulties of her calling to be a mom. And I understand that not all of us come from that kind of home environment with that kind of influence, but being or having a true mom isn't just about environment or just a title or a position, nor is it just a biological issue. It's an issue of a heart overflowing with a nurturing love that reaches out to embrace and invest in a life. It's a kind of love that DNA has nothing to do with. So today is a day that we should celebrate and we should thank God for all forms of motherhood. We celebrate and we thank God for the courageous love of all of our biological moms. We celebrate and we thank God for the love and sacrifice of moms who choose adoption and foster care to the most vulnerable. We thank God and we celebrate the love and the dedication of spiritual moms who poured their life into another person. And we honor and we pray for God's comfort for those moms who have suffered the enormous pain of loss. May God bless all of our moms today. Happy Mother's Day. If you're able, please stand with me this morning for our scripture reading. We're going to be looking at the book of Jonah, chapter 2. If you're using a chair Bible, that would be on page 920. As always, if you need a personal Bible, please accept one of our chair Bibles as a gift to you. Let's read God's Word from Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit. O oh, Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. 
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the instruction, guidance, and comfort that it provides. As Pastor Brandon comes, strengthen him, encourage him, and prepare our hearts to receive and live out the message that you've given him. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Good morning, church, and happy Mother's Day. Uh, as Rob has said and so eloquently put, um, just the importance of the various types of roles of being a mom. What a, what a special um, just honorarium to, to moms and, and what Rob has said today. So thank you, Rob. Um, we, uh, we love women here at this church, and we, we love you so much that, that we have a whole ministry that is just dedicated to ministering to women. And uh, there's a team of women that head that up. My wife is kind of at the helm of that. She is passionate about um, reaching women, teaching them God's word, teaching them to, to be strong theological mamas, uh, to be discipling women as we read about in the New Testament. And this week is going to be a very special week for women. If you did not know, uh, this week is our annual women's retreat here at the church. And that's going to kick off on Friday. And uh, I'm told to tell you that this is the last day that you can register for that. So uh, Emily will be a be available in the back with the iPad to register you if you've had issues with that. Uh, our registration's been up and down this past week, such as technology, but that's okay. Uh, if you're here today and you'd like to register, you can go in the back uh, and they'll get you registered for that. You won't want to miss it. It'll be a great time of fellowship with other women. It'll be a great time uh, just just having fun, but also going deeper in God's Word, which I think is the good balance of what ministry should be. Um, and then also, it's just a word to the husbands in the, the room that if you forgot a gift for your wife, this would be a great gift. So you can go back there and say, babe, I registered you for the women's conference. So it's a great thing, just a reminder. Also, we have a, a photo booth in the other building uh, to just um, you know, moms love pictures, so this is a great opportunity for you to take a picture with your mom so she can have it as her Facebook profile picture till Christmas Eve when we have the photo booth again. So do that for your mothers. They, they, they love that you're here, and, and just celebrate them today. So when I think of, of my mom, or I think of <clears throat> Emily as a mom, or I think of most moms that I know, the word that comes to mind in my heart and mind is this, grace. Specifically with my mom growing up, she grew up with, or, or she raised four boys. So it was a task to raise all four of us boys who loved hockey, who loved fighting, and we were rough and tumble boys, but she did it. And she did it with grace. There was much grace that we needed as we uh, inevitably, in the basement playing hockey, used her precious moments dolls as like targets to shoot at. And they would break and I know that it would break her heart, but we thought they were creepy, so we'd shoot at them. And, uh, and she would, her heart would be broken, but she would say, well, I, I still love you. And she would show us grace in those moments. So, so to be a mom, I think, is really, it's, it's attributed to this idea of grace. And I think that grace is one of the major themes of motherhood. And I think that as we look and examine motherhood today, as we think of the grace that mothers exemplify, we also see that that grace is rooted in who Christ is, rooted in who God is, and rooted in our text today. That, that although grace is not necessarily mentioned at all in the book of Jonah, <clears throat> grace is the unsung hero of Jonah. That it is a book that is all about grace, especially today in the, the pivotal chapter of Jonah, chapter 2, we see God's grace perfectly on display. In chapter 1, we saw God's grace and the fact that he was gracious towards evil Nineveh, that he was going to send a prophet to them. That was God's grace, as Pastor Sam looked at last week. And we saw that, that he was gracious to the sailors and allowing them to see the mighty hand of God in, in the, the storm and then the calming of the storm. And then they worshiped the Lord afterwards. That was God's grace towards those sailors. It was God's grace towards Jonah in providing a, a fish to swallow him. And a lot of times we don't look at it like that. So, well, the fish was, again, a part of God's discipline and his judgment on Jonah, but it was his grace. And we'll see that again today. So grace is in every single chapter of this book, but it's especially here in chapter 2 of Jonah's prayer. So today, Jonah's eyes are opened to his unmerited favor 
from God. So I want to just look at that again today as we look at verses 1 through 10. Let me read them for you once again. It says in verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah up upon the dry land. Before we analyze this text deeper before we dive into the, the expository preaching of what Jonah's doing here, I want to just take a 30,000 foot view of, of Jonah's prayer. And, and I think that as we analyze the substance of Jonah's prayer, what happens is we see something very quickly rise to the surface. That if we do a deeper Bible study, which I encourage you to do, to study God's word deeper, we see that the terminology that Jonah is using here in his prayer is not original to him. These are not Jonah's necessarily original words that he's praying. We find his words all throughout the Psalms. They're all permeating different Psalms that are found in those 150 Psalms that we have in Scripture. And rather, this is not so much plagiarism as it is he's he's praying and communicating something deep about prayer. He's teaching us, in a way, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, how we are called to pray to God. So what we see here in Jonah is a prophet who is praying the Psalms of God. And I want to show you that today. I want to show you this idea that that we are called to pray Scripture. And, and, And I want to show you the consistency of what Jonah is saying with the Psalms. So First and foremost, at the top of his prayer, we see in Psalm 120, verse 1, that the the psalmist writes this. We have that scripture. We can put it up there for you. It says, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. And Jonah, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 2 says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. We see is that there's a a correlation that takes place there. Again, in Psalm uh, 88, verses 6 and 7, the psalmist writes there, you have put me in the depths of the pit. In the regions dark and deep, your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all of your waves. And Jonah writes in Jonah verse two, chapter 2, verse 3, he says, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Psalm 18, 6 says, In my distress I called upon the Lord. To my God I cried for help. And from his temple he heard my voice. And my cry reached his ears. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 7, he says, And my prayer came into your holy temple. Jonah is praying scripture. He's praying the Psalms. He's praying God's word back to him. And it beautifully applies to his circumstances. It beautifully applies to to what he's going through. And the, the charge here is that if we're going to learn about prayer, which is prayer is our focus this year, we should learn that we should be praying scripture. And if you want to know how to do that deeper, we actually have a book that is available at our Connection Center back here. It's called Praying the Scriptures by Donald Whitney. It's a wonderful book about how we pray Scripture. This summer, we're going to be focusing on the summer and the Psalms, and we're going to be looking at how the Psalms teach us how to pray. We should be praying Scripture because God loves to hear His Word. And we should be a people who pray Scripture because the words of Scripture are God's words. They're his words. We're praying his words back to them. But these words also convey deep and strong spiritual truth and ideas and emotions. So when we pray scripture, we pray the very word of God back to him, and it's pleasing to his ears. I think about this in my own life. Um, 
a couple of years back when we were in Florida, uh, an unfortunate incident happened at church where Peyton was kissed by a boy. Big no-no, right? Because what I want to raise, I want to raise sensitive girls, but I want to raise dangerous girls, right? Like, like, I don't want them to fear me. I want them to fear my daughters because they're strong and dangerous. And this boy uh, kissed Peyton. She was sharing it with us at dinner. Uh, and I like slowly looked over at Emily, and Emily gave me one of these, just like, it's okay. Like, and I'm like, all right, well, what did you say, Peyton? And she said, I, I, I didn't know what to say, Dad. I was uncomfortable. I didn't know what to say to him. I said, I said, listen, I'll tell you what to say. I will give you the words to say. I'll say, you look him dead in the eyes and say, you little fart sniffer. <laughs> if you ever want to chew your food again, you'll never do that again. And she says, can I say that? I said, you can 100% say that, right? And, and what, what I realized was that she needed the words to say. I don't think fart sniffer has ever been said in this cir- services before. <laughs> it is not a theological term, I promise you. Uh, but, but she needed the words to say. She didn't know what to say. And she needed words in that moment to convey her heart, to convey her fear, to convey her uncomfortability. And I gave her those words. And I didn't just give her those words just because she didn't know what to say. I gave them those words so that she could be protected. And that's what God does with his word. When we don't know what to pray, when we don't know how to convey our hearts, when we need words that that protect who we are, we find them in Scripture. We shouldn't find them in just quoting what other people say. We should find them in the very words of God. See, God does the same to us. He gives us words to pray, especially when we lack words to pray. And when we lack words to pray, a lot of times it hinders us from praying. I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to say, Pastor Brandon. I'm feeling something so deeply. I don't know what to pray. See, the solution to a lackluster prayer life, the solution to a prayer life that, that doesn't know what to pray is to pray Scripture. So many people come to me and tell me, they're like, my prayer life is struggling, Pastor Brandon. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to pray. I don't even know what to pray anymore. My encouragement always to them is pray Scripture. Go to the Psalms. Pray God's word back to him. And when you do that, I I promise you, if if you are struggling in your prayer life today, it will revolutionize the way that you pray. It will revolutionize you from praying, God, bless this food to the nourishment of my body, to God, I, I praise you that you are my rock and my fortress and my shield and whom I can hide. God, I need you to be that for me today. Also, Scripture in the Psalms as I said, sometimes more accurately convey our hearts than we can convey. Sometimes we don't have the words to say. The pain and the hurt and the depression may be too deep for us to express what we're actually feeling, but the Psalms is a beautiful book because in the Psalms, deep emotion is conveyed poetically and beautifully in those those songs, in those prayers. So we can pray those, but as we do, As you pray the Psalms, it's going to require that you actually study God's Word, that you study what it's saying so that you're praying accurately back to who God is. It's going to require that you study God's Word. You need to know what God's Word is saying in order to properly pray it. When we see that substance of what Jonah is praying here today, what we're seeing is that he's ultimately praying four major declarations about who God is and one declaration about himself. So five total declarations that he's going to declare in this prayer, and I want to examine them today. The first declaration is this. In verse 2, the declaration is that God listens. He declares God listens. Look at verse 2. He says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. The declaration he's making his prayers that, that God, you listen, and, and it doesn't sound like a profound truth, because for most of us, listening is the bare minimum that we can do. We're always listening. We can't turn our listening off. We're always hearing things. So although it's an easy thing to do, we, we, we do well to consider Jonah's circumstances up to this point, that, that God spoke to Jonah and said, hey, I want you to go and preach to Nineveh. And Jonah did not listen. In fact, he ran. So Jonah was unwilling to listen to God. And now he prays and he's expecting God to listen to him. What an interesting irony of what is happening here. 
That he won't listen to God, but he's expecting God to hear him. And that audacity that Jonah has is only found in small children. If you've ever parented small children, you know that the audacity of what's happening with Jonah is the audacity of our children. And I know it to be true in my life because my daughters, I'll tell them something. I'll say, hey, could you do this for me? And they're like, yep. And they didn't didn't hear a word I said, right? But then we get in the car and we're driving somewhere and Emily and I are talking like, dad, 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 mom, 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 right? They're demanding that we listen to them. They're unwilling to listen to me, but they demand that I listen to them. And that's what Jonah's doing. And the audacity is not that Jonah would demand that God listen to him. The audacity is that God actually listens to him. That God hears him. And not only does God hear him, but it says in verse 2, he answered me. He answers him, and that is the more audacious thing, that God didn't owe Jonah any type of response here, but he does anyway. He gives him a response. He listens, and he answers. There's no grudge that's held between God and Jonah. Instead, there's grace. As we kicked off our time, each one of these declarations is going to point us back to grace. See, God gives grace to Jonah and listening to him. See, we would write people off for far less than this. If I were giving counsel to somebody or asking someone to do something and they left my office and they ran away from me and totally disregarded me, I'd be like, well, bye. I don't want anything to do with you, right? And then they came back to me and they said, well, could you just listen to me? I want you to hear me. I'd be like, no, I don't got the time of day for you. That's my humanity speaking. And thankfully, we are not God. Thankfully that we only have a holy God who is far different from who we are. And in his grace, he listens. That even though Jonah ran from God and mistreated him, God meets Jonah with amazing grace. He gives credence to the cry of Jonah. And he sees that Jonah is in distress and he takes pity on on poor little undeserving Jonah. God takes pity And he hears him. He answers him. Church, God hears us today too. God hears us. We don't get to a certain point where God just stops listening and turns his ears off. We don't commit, uh, well, well, I did this sin instead of that sin, so God won't listen to me now. No, no, no. What we see is that, that God hears his children. God hears our cries. And notice where Jonah's crying out from. He cries out from the belly of Sheol, from his distress, from the darkness, and God hears him. That we can't run far enough away from the listening ear of God. Maybe somebody needs to hear that today. Because you've been running, as Pastor Sam talked about last week, you've been running far and fast from God. And you're like, well, he would never want to listen to me. Well, Jonah probably would have thought the same thing, but the audacious thing he did is he prayed and God heard him. You're not far from the listening ear of God. God hears us no matter what, and he desires to hear us. He's created a way for us to do that. He's created prayer as a way for us to communicate with him. But more often than not, it is not God's unwillingness to listen to us in prayer. More often than not, what is true is that we are unwilling to pray because of our pride. We're unwilling to pray to him because we're embarrassed by by where we've run to or what we've done. We say, well, I'm just so embarrassed, I can't even talk to God right now. I I just can't do it. And our embarrassment and our pride keeps us from running back to a God who would hear us and answer us as he did with his wandering servant, Jonah. Don't let your pride be the restricting factor on crying out to God because he desires to hear from you. And that is a major declaration in this prayer. God, in his grace, listens. The second declaration is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Look at verse 3. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Notice how Jonah emphasizes the personal pronoun, your. He says, he says, you cast me into the deep. Your waves and your billows crash over me. You see, what, what he's saying is that, God, you were involved in this process. You were involved in what took place with me on the boat and the storm and all of these different things. He says, you cast me into the deep. 
But in reality, as we read last week, it was not God who cast him in the deep. It was the sailors. So why is he saying this? Is he wrong or is he misguided? No, what Jonah is doing is he's acknowledging the fact that God's sovereign hand was all over his circumstances. That none of that was happening that was outside of God's control. It wasn't like God was like, hey, listen, the weather report's bad. Don't go, Jonah. No, God's like, I'm bringing the storm, buddy. I'm going to bring the fish, too. And what we see is that, that all of this, all of the people that were involved, the, the main players, which were the sailors, were just a part of God working his divine and sovereign plan in the life of Jonah. And, and all of this was God's loving discipline on his servant Jonah. God was using the circumstances of the storm, the circumstances of the fish, to remind Jonah of his deep need for God. And Jonah thought very foolishly, last week in chapter one, he thought very foolishly that he could run from God, that he was the master of his own destiny. That's where you're at. You think that you can get away from God or you can just control the circumstances? You can't. It's all under God's sovereign control. Jonah took matters into his own hands, and he ran from his God-given responsibility. And God, as the loving Father that he is that we studied in the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, that loving Father that he is, brought Jonah back. See, this discipline by God is a very good thing. Let me say that again. The discipline of God is a very good thing good thing. And and I realized that 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 sounds like a curse word today in our generation of soft parenting, that discipline is a good thing. But that is exactly what we see in Scripture. Look at the example of, of God our Father who lovingly disciplines his children. And the discipline that he has is not soft discipline. Sometimes it is, But sometimes that discipline is instructive. Sometimes that discipline is going to hurt a little bit. And what we see is that that ultimately, even if it hurts a little bit, even if it's soft, the discipline of God is always for our good and his glory. That is why God sovereignly disciplines his children. The beauty of discipline is is that where we do it poorly, or we've seen it done poorly in our lives, maybe through our parents or through other people, we've seen discipline done poorly. God does it perfectly. And it's in his perfect sovereignty that he disciplines Jonah, but he's always in control. He's always in control. It was God's waves that rocked the boat. It was God's storm that he brought up. It was God in chapter 1, verse 17, who instructed the fish, the fish was at his commands, to swallow Jonah. God was behind all of it. God was never out of control. But he was always perfectly sovereignly at the helm of what was happening in the discipline of his servant Jonah, and he was using it. To God's sovereign discipline on this earth is evidence of his grace. When God disciplines us, that is evidence of the fact that his grace is is in our lives, that that God's discipline here is to grab our attention, that there is an eternal discipline that is waiting all of those people who don't trust in him and are disobedient. The discipline of God shows his love and his grace towards us. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. It says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. God's sovereign discipline And the orchestration of our lives and the circumstances of our lives is evidence of his deep love for us. It's a picture of his grace that he would sovereignly correct the error of our disobedience like he did for Jonah. And see, if God were one of us, he could have just let little old Jonah drown and nobody would have been the wiser. Everyone would have been like, I probably would have did the same thing, God. Yep, he ran away from you. Sorry. Sorry. See you, dude. Get somebody else. Next man up. Next prophet up. That's not what God does. God lovingly disciplines his servant to correct the error. And that is the picture of God's grace, is that, that in his sovereignty, he would correct the error of our disobedience like he did for Jonah. And he sovereignly appointed that storm. He sovereignly appointed the waves to remind Jonah of who he was. And then the fish... 
The fish was God's grace. Think about that. Jonah describes himself as drowning here. He would have drowned in the discipline. But in the midst of the discipline, God provides grace in the mouth of a fish that rescues him from drowning. A lot of times we don't view the fish as God's grace, but God is sovereignly working his discipline. And God's sovereignty is evidence of his grace. The third major declaration is this. It's found in verse 4. God desires reconciliation. God desires reconciliation. Look at verse 4. It says, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. What we see here is that Jonah acknowledges here that he is far from God. He says, I'm driven from your sight. And we know that he was attempting to run away from God physically to Tarshish. He was, he was trying to run away. But the, the distance he's referring to here, I do not believe, is a physical distance from God. I rather, it seems to be that he's acknowledging that there is spiritual distance between him and God. Jonah realizes, I believe, like David did in Psalm 137, verse 7. He says, where can I go from your presence, O Lord? You're everywhere. Jonah's realizing in the storm, I cannot outrun God. But I can distance myself spiritually from him. And as Jonah distances himself spiritually from God, God continues to pursue him. What a beautiful picture of who God is. And this is really the message of Scripture, is that God pursues us. That's the message that's all throughout Scripture. If we were to look at Scripture, the parable of the lost coin, the the woman pursues the coin, and God says, "That's, that's that's what I do. The parable of the lost sheep, God pursues the lost sheep. Adam and Eve, they sin and they hide and God pursues them. The message of scripture is that God pursues us. A beautiful picture that as we wander away, God pursues us to bring us back to reconciliation, to a right relationship. That becomes very clear when Jonah mentions the temple here in verse 4 and then later in verse 7. He mentions it twice the temple of God. And you say, well, well, why is the temple so significant? I know it was a major landmark for the Jews. Why is it significant? Well, the temple was where the presence of God was. The temple was the, the physical representation of God with his people Israel. So for Jonah to long to look again at the temple, he's longing to get back to the place where he can acknowledge God's role and his presence in his life. But not only that, the temple was where the atonement for sins took place. That they would go to the temple and they would bring their lamb or their goat or their sin offering and they would sacrifice it so that they could atone for their sins, so they could be reconciled to God. Their sin distanced them from God, but the death and the blood that covered their sin allowed them to walk in relationship with God again. So the temple was an affirmation of coming back to God, of reconciling the sin that hindered the relationship. And if Jonah didn't want anything to do with God, then he wouldn't have desired to look again upon the temple of God. He would have just continued to keep running. But the fact that God desires reconciliation with sinful people is evidence of his amazing grace. The fact that God desires to reconcile sinful men to himself is evidence of God's absolute and and sovereign, amazing grace. That we don't deserve to have a way back to God. We don't deserve it. When we've walked away, we should have just walked away and he should have let us walk away. But he didn't and he provides a way for us. We don't deserve him pursuing us, but he does. And the fact that God has opened a path of reconciliation is good news. And it's the good news of God's amazing grace because the next declaration that we find in verse 5, which is this, Jonah was dead. Jonah was dead. Look at verse 5. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Jonah's saying that, that this is true of me. I was dead. That, that this is really the only thing that's declared about Jonah in this prayer. Everything else is about God. This is the only thing that declares about himself, that I am dead. 
we're reading this with a soundtrack, this would be where the music gets really tense, right? The deep cello starts playing and Jaws theme comes through and we're like, oh no, Jonah's drowning, right? That's, this is the part of the prayer where he's, he's talking about that. And the way that he's worded his prayer would suggest that he's drowning. The weeds wrapped over my head. I was going down into this place where the gates or the bars would close over me forever. Those are deathly terms that he's using to describe his struggle. This is not the Veggie Tales picture of Jonah, where he's thrown out and he's just kind of floating, and then the fish is like, okay, swallow you, right? No, he went down. I don't know if he didn't know how to swim, or the storm was just so bad, it just was overcoming him, but he is drowning, and he is dead, and he's coming to grips with the fact that he is dead. And as he does that, as he realizes that, he realizes that all hope for him is lost. And from his words, he has come to grips with the fact that, that nothing will save him. Nothing he can do will save him. And that bleak picture of Jonah is actually an important realization for Jonah. An important realization that, that, that you know what, in, in his wandering and in his, his running, it was ultimately going to lead to death. Wandering and running will lead to death. My question for us is, do we realize the same that's true of our lives? That as, as Sam has talked about last week in the running and running from God, that do we realize that the same conclusion that Jonah's coming to is the same conclusion for our life, that in our disobedience and running from God, that it will only lead to death? Now, there's nothing that we can do in our own strength the waves of our disobedience are crashing over us. The weeds are pulling us down. We're living according to our own way. And that's the message of the world. Live according to your own way. But the end of that message is live according to your own way and you will die. We want our comfort. We want to live our truth. We want our comfort, we want our happiness, we want our pleasure more than we want God. We want our family more than we want God. We want that car more than we want God. We want the lower golf score more than we want God. And in placing those things, those desires over God, we're running towards them. And when we run towards them, we're running away from God. But here is the grace in the declaration that Jonah is dead, that God in his grace allows us to see the end of our running. And it's death. The end of our running is death. And for some of us, I, I acknowledge that in our congregation, there are people who have walked very storied pasts. They have very difficult pasts with, that wrestle with addictions and and, and alcoholism, and drug abuse, and, and all these different things, and, and, and even gang-affiliated people, they're all here. They're all radically changed by God's grace. And, and there was a point, if you talk to any of them, that they realized that they were at their lowest, and they realized if they continued in that lifestyle, they were going to die. They realize it. And for some of you, you, that realization is more tangible because you hit rock bottom and you realized where your running was taking you and you realized that you needed something to save you and you couldn't do it. Church, we must be aware of our deadness, aware of the fact that, that our flesh is dead, that, that God in his grace makes us aware of the fact that we are dead. And when we realize that, well, then the very the most important declaration in this whole entire prayer comes to light in verse 6. It says this, Yet, yet, you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. God saves. The most important declaration is that God saves. That if we are unable to save ourselves, and that's what we realized in the last declaration, well then we must reach out to something to save us. If we can't do it, something has to save us. We can't just result to just, well, we're just dead and there's nothing we can do. Nobody gives up like that. We all look for something. And Jonah very boldly acknowledges that he was dead and dying, but he says, yet, yet, contrasting his deadness, he says, yet you, God, brought me up from the pit. God, he's declaring that, that and he's acknowledging that, that he was dead and he's using this salvific language 
that God was involved in his circumstances. And God, you saved me. God, you saved Jonah. Jonah didn't save Jonah. God, you saved Jonah. And Jonah's proclaiming that in his prayer. God, it was only you. The weeds had pulled me down. The bars were over me forever. God, it was only you. And Jonah says in verse 7, he says, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Very important designation that he makes there. I remembered the Lord. Well, what did he remember about the Lord? Do you remember that he was there? Did he remember that he was God? What does he remember? Well, I think he remembers that the very message that he was called to bring to Nineveh at that point in his life applied to his life. The very message that he was called to bring to Nineveh was this. It was that that if they repent, then God will save them. That God is the one who will bring salvation. That, That if Nineveh and if Jonah and if you repent, then God will save you. Jesus tells us that in Mark chapter 1 verse 15. He says, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the good news of what Jesus is coming to do for you. The message that he was tasked to bring to Nineveh was the very message that he needed to remember as he's fading away in the abyss and the fish saves him. And God, in his amazing grace, saves sinful men like Jonah. And he saves sinful people like Nineveh and like you and like I. Grace is how we are saved. Paul tells us that in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, he says, we are saved by grace. God's grace is essential to the message of salvation, that we don't deserve or earn God's favor. There's nothing that we can do. There's not enough good we can do, not enough church services we can attend, not enough money that we can give. None of that is true. Rather, what saves us is God's grace in our lives. See, the prayer from Jonah is a prayer of salvation. That's what Jonah's praying. But it's not a prayer of salvation. God, save me from this fish. It smells awful in here. It smells like sushi, right? God, save me from this. Save me from that. No, his his prayer of salvation is, God, save me from my sinful running from you. Prayer of salvation. And that truth, that prayer of salvation is a prayer that every single one of us need to pray. Every single one of us need to acknowledge. And and I want to just highlight, as we conclude our time, I want to highlight two types of people who are absolutely sitting here today with an earshot of me that need to pray this prayer. The first type of person is this. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've never said, Jesus, you are Lord of my life, you're Lord of everything, I give it all to you because I can't save myself, I need you to do it. If you've never done that, then you need this prayer and every single one of its declarations. You need to declare that, that God, you listen And that God does listen, that he wants to hear from you in prayer. That because you may not be a child of his yet, it doesn't mean that you have to get the membership card before he'll listen to you. No, God will listen to you. God desires to hear from you. He desires that you pray for him. You're not too far gone. You're not too far away from his love or too far in your running that he doesn't want to listen to you. If you stop and you cry out to him, he will hear you. You also need to know that the declaration is that God is sovereign over your life. That he's orchestrated your circumstance. He's orchestrated the things that have happened in your life to bring you to this realization and to bring you to this church service today. That that I don't know why you walked in the doors. I don't know why you're listening to this right now online or wherever you're listening to this. I don't know why you're seeking this out, but God has sovereignly orchestrated you to hear this message today. And as he sovereignly has orchestrated you to do that, you're declaring that he is sovereign. You're acknowledging the fact that that you've walked through a difficult life, that there's circumstances that have maybe woke you up to the fact that God is sovereign. You need that declaration. You need to hear the third declaration, which is that God desires reconciliation. That that you, in your sin and your shame, in your wandering and your disobedience, you have run very far from who God is. But you don't have to stay there. God wants to restore you. God created a way for you to be restored. 
And he's done that for you. And that's important for you to realize is that that the hope for Jonah was that, that he would go back to the temple to reconcile the relationship. But our hope today is not in the temple. Our hope today is not in the sacrifice of animals. Our hope today is in the sacrifice of the Lamb of God that was once and for all for all of our sins. That Jesus died in your place and for your sins. And when you put your faith and trust in that, it's good for all of the world. It's good for every single person. It's good to cover every sin. And it's good enough to reconcile you to God that we can only be reconciled to God by surrendering to the fact that Jesus died for you. You need to realize that because the fourth declaration is true, that just like Jonah, you are dead. You are dead. That there's nothing that you can do to change your spiritual state. You are drowning. And maybe that analogy of drowning fits with where your life is today. You are drowning spiritually. And as you drown spiritually, you realize that there must be something that can save you. And you're giving God a try. That's why you showed up here today. And the last declaration is true, and it's the hope of all of this, is that God saves. That he alone has the power to save you, that you can't save yourself, that you are dead, but God desires to save you. He's a saving God. As Jonah declared in verse 10 or verse 9, he says, Salvation belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to Jonah, it doesn't belong to the strong, it doesn't belong to the godly, it doesn't belong to the good, it belongs to the Lord, and he graciously gives it to sinful men. So maybe you're here today, and that's where you're at. Well, then the call for you is to surrender to Jesus. As we sing the song in just a moment, the the invitation is for you, if you want to pray right where you're at, you can pray. Or our stage is perfectly designed, that this little stair here is perfect for you to kneel and pray at. And we would love to pray with you and for you and to encourage you. And if you're like, I don't want to walk the aisle, that's fine too. You can talk to myself or Pastor Sam or Pastor Matt afterwards. We would love to share with you how you can know that God saves you. How you can know that truth for your life. But there is a second group of people that's here today. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. That surrendered to Jesus I've, I, I know that he is Lord of my life, but you haven't been living like it. You've been disobedient to God. You've been running from his desired will for your life. You've been running from the fact that he commands certain things in Scripture, and you've been running far from it. Well, you need this prayer as well. You need its declarations. You need to know that God listens and he wants to hear you, that your pride will keep you from coming back to God, but you need to run back to a gracious and loving God. And you need to run back to him and and confess. You need to run back to him and throw yourself at his mercy. God listens and he wants to hear from you. Don't let your wandering and your prodigal living keep you from God. Cry out to him. The second declaration needs to be true of your life, that God is sovereign over your circumstances. That he can use whatever you're going through. He can make it a beautiful part of your testimony, your story. He can make the difficulty or the pain in your life something that wakes you up, but then also something that he can use for his glory. Pastor Sam does that beautifully in his story. He's got a a difficult past, but he celebrates the fact that God's grace is evident in his life and he proclaims that openly and authentically. And I love him for it. God is sovereign over his circumstances and over your circumstances and God's discipline is ultimately rooted in his love. Remind yourself of that. Hebrews 12, remind yourself of the fact that God disciplines his sons whom he loves. But you need to know the third declaration, that God desires reconciliation in your relationship. That you are positionally, in your salvation, you are reconciled to God through Jesus, but in your disobedience, you're hurting the relationship and the intimacy that God wants to have with you. And like David, we need to pray, God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. God, restore me to that place. And then you need the fourth declaration, that you are dead. You need to know that. That not 
Not spiritually you're dead because Christ has made you a new creation. You are alive in Christ, but you are powerless to do this on your own. You're like a car whose battery doesn't work. You have all the potential, but no energy. You're dead. You need to lean into God's power and strength to change your heart, to change your course of life, and to change your desires. You need to be dependent upon God. And the greatest way that we are dependent upon God is through our prayer lives because it's an expression of our dependency upon him. And then you need the last declaration. You need to know that God saves. That whatever you are chasing and you're wandering, it will not save you. It will not deliver you. It will not satisfy you. That the only thing that can save you, deliver you, and satisfy you is God alone. That God is the saving one. Salvation belongs only to God. It doesn't belong to a doctor. It doesn't belong to money. It doesn't belong to comfort or happiness or relationship status or children or whatever it is. The only thing that can save you is God. We need to pray with Jonah in verse 10 that salvation belongs to the Lord. Because the theme, and this is our last point, the theme of Jonah is this, is that God's grace is evident in our salvation from sin. It's evident in rescuing dead sinners. But God's grace is also evident in our restoration from wandering. God's grace needs to be evident in every area of our life. That Jonah is not a letter about God's wrath in a storm, that God's wrath was evident in Jonah's life in a fish, and he's this wrathful, vengeful God who disciplines the ones who are disobedient, and he's just divinely spanking Jonah. No, instead, what Jonah is communicating, and especially here in chapter 2, it paints a picture of a loving God who brings his servant back, who rescues him to go and preach salvation to needy people. And that is the Christian life, that we are saved to go and preach. We need to go love others and love God and make disciples. And the beauty is, as undeserving as Nineveh was, as undeserving as Jonah was, and as undeserving as we are, God's grace is evident. God is our God of amazing grace. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for your word, I thank you for this prayer from Jonah that reminds us that, God, you are a God of all grace. That, God, when we don't deserve it, and we really don't, God, you offer and give grace. And, God, I pray that if there's somebody here today who's been wrestling with these declarations of who you are, wrestling with this idea and concept of grace and, and all of its elements, God, I pray that today they would not leave here today without talking to somebody that they would take advantage of the front of our stage to pray. They would take advantage of their seat to just right where they're at, pray, and surrender their life to you. But God, I pray also for the prodigals and the wandering servants that are here today in the midst of us. That God, in their wandering, that they would realize the deadness of their way and they would turn to you. That they would desire reconciliation. That they would desire to see you save them from their desire for all of these other things. Because you are a God and you are the only God of salvation. God, we thank you for these things, and we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us?
may send people. Have a great week in the Lord.